Good morning, I'm Milton Walker and we are here to provide special coverage of the handing down of the judgment at the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in London of the case involving Vibes Cartel and its three co-convicts, Kahira Jones, Andre St. John and Sean Campbell. With me uh, in studio is Dion Jackson-Miller, our legal correspondent, um, host of All Angles. Dion, this is a, a very important case. All Jamaica is literally on tenterhooks waiting for this judgment. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I don't think, I'm, I was trying to remember in recent years if I've ever seen a verdict so eagerly anticipated, and I honestly can't remember. Right, and d briefly, if you just tell us again, uh, what are the options, what are the likely outcomes that the, the Privy Council, uh, the law lords would um, decide? Okay, well, broadly speaking, there are four. So at the two extremes, one, the Privy Council could decide to allow the appeal, meaning that in that situation, the appellants, Vibes Cartel et al, would go free. Mm -hmm. At the other extreme, the Privy Council could decide to um, to uphold the conviction, what they call to affirm affirm the conviction, in mm -hmm. which case the status quo would remain, nothing would change, Cartel et al would remain in prison. Mm -hmm. Then you have two other options which are more nuanced and I think people generally expect that we're going to be hearing one of these two options. Mm -hmm. It could be, we hear a lot of people talking about a retrial. Now the Privy Council itself is not going to order a retrial, they don't operate like that. Okay. What they would do is to remit it, send it back to the Court of Appeal for the Court of Appeal to quash a conviction and decide if there should be a retrial. And there are a number of issues that they take into consideration when they're making that decision, which I'll come to in a moment. But the fourth option is people may have heard lawyers talking about the proviso and applying the proviso. Now, there is a provision in law, the statute that operates or that that is the what should I say is a law under which a court of appeal operates mm -hmm. that allows the court to find in a particular case that even though there has been an irregularity even a material irregularity they can still uphold the conviction by applying what's called the proviso in other words the court can say yes there was a problem in this case but we still think that the evidence was so strong and there is a particular test that is used they say that if a jury that's properly directed would still have convicted on the evidence that mm -hmm. was pre presented mm -hmm. then the conviction can be upheld and one of the important issues here is of course the interest of justice so the courts have said for instance the privy council said in a case called dennis reed against the Queen that they look at the fact that um, whether it's in the interest of justice that people who are guilty of serious crime should be brought to justice and not escape merely because of some technical blunder by the judge in the conduct of the trial and his summing up to the jury that that would play on their mind if they're trying to make the decision as whether or not the matter should be sent back for a retrial or sent back to the Court of Appeal, I beg your pardon, mm -hmm. for them to decide if there should be a retrial. Because they're going to look at the circumstances. You know, is this a very strong case? Right. Is it a heinous case? Is mm -hmm. it one that really and truly, if there was a problem, it should be... It should so be in other ahead. words, this proviso rule would come in, um, the fact, with the telecommunications, um, the tampering of the, tele the, the, the cell phone, that w w where the voice notes were, were pulled from, and whether or not the issue of the, the, when the bribery of the, the juror came up, and the argument that it should have been dismissed, that they would say, yes, those were missteps, but based on the evidence, we'll still... Um, well, as we saw in the, when we watch the hearings, really and truly, I mean, we think it's going to come down to the issue of the juror. Mm -hmm. And just to remind our viewers that there was a, a juror in the matter who had attempted to bribe the four women. Mm -hmm. And the question was whether, in fact, this juror should have been dismissed from the panel mm -hmm. and the case continue without him, right. or whether, in fact, the entire jury should have been dismissed and the case started all over again. And the concern was whether, in fact, um, this, as I call them, the tainted juror, the bent juror, mm -hmm. whether the rest of the jury, having heard about the attempted bribery, would then have come down extra hard 
on the defendants, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. even though there was no link before the court that the defendants had anything to do with the bribery. So the concern was that the, the jury maybe would have heard, wait, hold on, them they try to bribe somebody? No, McQuay, come down hard, let us convict. Or, or that's a, a sign of guilt. That was the concern. Right. So they, and you heard it for, for the people who watched the Privy Council hearings that the, the, the judges were very concerned about this. This was what they spent most of the time on. Mm -hmm. This was what they were asking. asking a lot of questions a lot about of questions about as right. to whether a fair trial because mm -hmm. that is that is the bottom line was a fair trial um conducted mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. cartel and the others in the circumstances of this tainted juror having still been sitting mm -hmm. with the jurors the other jurors having gone into the jury room mm -hmm. and been a part of that deliberation mm -hmm. could this process still have been said to have been a fair trial for the defendants how about the other point um the third one that <coughs> the it was wrong to invite the jury to reach a verdict late in the day given the special circumstances in the case. We, we heard that as a, as a point, and somebody was asking me today, why is this a big issue? Now, one of the issues is that, remember, our jurors don't have a reputation, don't have a habit of sitting for five hours, eight hours, 10 hours. You know, mm -hmm. the average is maybe two to three hours. In this particular situation, what had happened mm -hmm. was that the jurors had been told to retire just before the time at which court would normally have ended for the day and the concern was right. here hold on is is are the jurors going to feel rushed are they going mm -hmm, to feel look mm -hmm. no man me tired me won't go, go home on. me could mm -hmm. just come to a decision so the matter would not have been properly considered again i mean we heard some questions but again i really think the gravamen of the privy council's concern was this issue of the the bribery and the juror who participated in that that you think is it will pivot on, on that i really do think so the whole issue of jury management and by way of interest that same juror in fact had been the subject of a discussion in judges chambers a little earlier in the trial because he had had contact with one of the defense attorneys and the jury is not supposed to have that kind of contact so there had been a discussion in chambers mm -hmm. but it had been decided that the matter could go ahead I'm gonna ask you to pause a bit because i think we are are live at the chambers of Bert Samuels, who is one of the attorneys. And if we could um, let our viewers see that, yes, that's Bert Samuels there uh, on screen. Uh, would Are we able to hear him at all? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're at the no. Jamaica Bar Association, I'm sorry. Not, not his, his um, chambers, it's Jamaica Bar Association. That's um, downtown Kingston and Harbour Street, is it? The verdict of not guilty should be entered and they should be freed. Once they are kept beyond tonight, it's going to be a civil action for false imprisonment. The state must release the accused when there is a verdict of not guilty to be released. So that's our big hope. Very good question. Oh. If the, so if he's taking questions from the media there, um, Dion, and I think I just heard him saying that if it's um, the, their appeal is upheld, he should be released today, this evening. I repeat, so if a retrial is ordered, we can go to the court to apply for bail pending the decision for the retrial, stage one. If a retrial is ordered, we would ask for bail in the Court of Appeal pending the hearing of the retrial. So that's how it is. Any other question? Okay, Dion, I want to ask you one question though. What if it, 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 it sent back to the Court of Appeal, can they decide um, and say that um, we're sending it back to the, the Court of Appeal for um, possible retrial. Can the Court of Appeal say, no, we don't think there should be a retrial and, and release him? Yes, absolutely. Um, which is why it's phrased in that way. It's not that the Privy Council is deciding on a retrial. They're sending it back to the Court of Appeal for the Court of Appeal to make that determination. I know people have spoken a lot about, you know, 
whether good or bad, the fact that the Privy Council is distant from us and, and from our society. And that is something that you see in the judgments because that is one of their, their, their reasons, in fact, because they say the local courts are in a better position to make certain kinds of decisions because they understand our climate, they understand the criminal um, justice situation, they understand what's happening in crime and, yeah. crime and violence here. And just to make the point quickly, in terms of a retrial, one of the issues, whether one goes ahead, one of the issues that would be looked at is whether or not a retrial would be oppressive. Mm -hmm. So I know that that cartel and the other defendants' lawyers have said, look, the murder took place, it's what, in 2011? 11, yeah, that 16th they've, of August. They've yeah. been mm -hmm. in jail now for 10 years and 10 years that plus, a retrial yeah. would be oppressive. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a case in 2020, the Privy Council, quite, quite different, in which the Privy mm -hmm. Council said a retrial would have been oppressive, but that was a situation in which the murder had taken place 21 years before and there had already been three trials. And the Privy Council said a fourth trial would be oppressive. So those are the kinds of things that the courts are going to weigh they're going to weigh the issue of whether there has been a miscarriage of justice in relation to the defendants, mm -hmm. the, the persons who have been convicted, but they're also very, very mindful of what is happening in the Jamaican society mm -hmm. and the whole issue of the interest of justice and whether the interests of justice would be served, in fact, by the kind of decision they're making. Do they at all take into account the fact that our justice system isn't quite perfect and, um, you know, the resource issues and so on? Well, I would say that they are extremely critical of the delays in the, in the system. And we've seen delays here. And again, in the matter I was just mentioning, the 2020 case of stubs that came from the Bahamas, they were pointing to the issue of delay in that particular case. And they were pointing to the fact that in none of the circumstances, the delay was not the cause of, of the, the appellant, it was the cause of the state. Mm -hmm. So when you say take into consideration resources, it is not in the context of saying, boy, me could give them a blight or give the state a blight. Mm -hmm. Rather, they have been very critical recently mm -hmm. of the issue of delay. And basically, I mean, uh, in as much as they can, can speak strongly, have been saying strongly that the local courts need to pull up their socks right. and that this issue of delay needs to be fixed. And the delays come from the, the time when written judgments are handed down from the lower courts and, and, and also from the Court of Appeals so that that lawyers can make decisions going forward. Yeah, just the time in which it takes for a matter to be heard um, mm -hmm. in the lower court, in the mm -hmm. Supreme Court, and then for it to be heard in the Court of Appeal, and then, as you said, for the judgments to be handed down. So there are different points at which we see delays in our system. Our judges are well aware of it. Our mm -hmm. Chief Justice, you know, has spoken. He did an interview with me on all angles, and he was very, very clear. Yeah. He has been publicly mm -hmm. that this issue of delay is untenable, it's unacceptable, it, it's embarrassing, and that we do need to fix it and they have been taking steps but we've had a series of privy council judgments recently in which they have raised that issue and have said you know that this is not okay I, I know the chief justice has been trying his best in terms of to reform institute reforms to bring cases um to the courts quicker to dispose of them uh, more quickly and so on but i don't think we're we're there yet we've made strides but we're not quite there yet um it's uh, just a minute before 11 o'clock, uh, 3.59 in London, where the Privy Council sits, and the judgment will be delivered at 4 p.m. That's 11 o'clock our time, the UK being five, or five hours ahead. So we are on standby for the verdict. Um, Dion, um, well, let me just recap again yeah. quickly what we're listening out for. It's whether or not there is going to be, the appeal is going to be allowed. That's what Bert Samuels was referring to when he said in that case um, they could be released. He, he says as early as today, whether or not the court will uphold the, the conviction, in which case nothing changes, and this, in fact, would be their last gasp. This is a final court of appeal. There's nowhere left to go mm -hmm. after the Privy Council, or whether they may say that there has been an irregularity. They, they are going to send it back to the, our Jamaican Court of Appeal for our Court of Appeal to decide if there should be a retrial, or whether they're going to say there was an irregularity, but the evidence is so strong and in the interest of justice that they're still upholding the conviction, in which case, again, um, the appellants, cartel, and the others remain in jail. I, I should say as well, mm -hmm. in relation to the issue of the, um, what should I say, the issue of whether or not there is a retrial, 
that in those circumstances, there are, there are serious concerns as to whether we can successfully hold a retrial. Child, because the, court, the Crown had one eyewitness, Lamar Chow, um, very strong, very cogent evidence, but everything hinged on him. him. If it is that he doesn't wish to come forward again, if it is that he doesn't hold up as well, what could, can happen? And, and there were so many witnesses in this particular matter, um, apart from Chow, although he was the sole eyewitness, the, the case hinged on him. Mm -hmm. There were exhibits, there were just a lot of moving parts. The trial, 64 days. Right. Um, and how well you mean those exhibits have been preserved in the, the what, 13 years since, the, or 12 years since the trial? And one of the things the cartel case showed us very embarrassingly is that we have a chain of custody issue. Mm -hmm. I think by far one of the most embarrassing things that happened for, for Jamaica in that trial was the issue of the cell phones, the yes. fact that cartel cell phones, which were in the custody of the police, evidence came out during the trial that that text had been sent from that phone and that calls had been made. And th this is so, so <sighs> abysmal and shocking mm -hmm. for such a major case, for such an important okay. piece of evidence mm -hmm. to, to think that the, the police cannot properly secure the exhibits. Mm -hmm. So there are different things we're going to have to look at. We're going to have to look at that issue of exhibits and this issue of jury management is going to be key. Okay. So, so for instance, what we're going to need to know is the question that has been raised because the reason the judge did not... All right, hang on just a second, Dion. I'm just going to see if they could bring up the link while we continue to talk because uh, Lord Reed, Lord Lloyd Jones, um, Lord Briggs, Lord Burroughs, and Lady Simla, uh, they are the justices who heard the case, and we will are waiting on them to deliver the verdict. I, I suspect it Lord comes, Reed will do. Sean Let's go Campbell, to it. Adija Palmer, Kahira Jones, and. Uh, this technology, Dion, the, the links um, um, buffering. Uh, were convicted of the murder of Clive Lizard Williams, to whom I shall refer as the deceased. At trial, the prosecution case was that the deceased and another man lay. Okay. It's buffering. He's uh, essentially recounting the case, to be they were in the... ...had been given two unlicensed firearms belonging to Palmer for sale. Mm. Yeah, the... ...keeping. The On the 16th of August, 2011, Campbell summoned Chow and the deceased to Palmer. house after they had failed to comply with Palmer's deadline for returning the weapons. The prosecution alleged that they were met on Yeah, they, they we're having some issues with the feed coming in from London. Uh, as you can see, it's it's Arrival by Palmer, Jones and Sinjin and the that Chow and the deceased were both attacked, after which Chow saw the deceased lying motionless on the ground with Jones bending over him. Chow escaped, but the deceased was never seen again. Uh, the Police attended Palmer's house on the 22nd of August 2011. They noticed the house smelled of disinfectant. On the 25th of August, they cordoned off the perimeter wall, treating the premises as a crime scene. When they returned... Hmm. On the 27th of August, they found that the entire interior of the house had been destroyed by fire. On the 29th of August... 
police forensics reported a foul odour emanating from the living room. On a further visit on the 30th of September, it was discovered that the rear of the house had been demolished. Police dug at the premises but did not find a body. Police seized the mobile phones of Palmer and Sinjin. Text message. And Dian is, is clearly recapping the, the, the events which um, happened Images, after the murder. Voice notes and a video from those phones were put in evidence at trial. The prosecution also relied on telecommunications data which the police had obtained from Digicel, a communications provider. The prosecution case was that the mobile phone evidence and telecommunications data, taken as a whole with Chow's evidence, proved the fact of the killing, the reason for the killing, the method of disposal of the deceased's body, and the identity of at least one of the killers, namely Palmer. The four appellants each denied murdering the deceased. At trial, the appellants objected to the telecommunications data being admitted as evidence. They argued that the data was inadmissible because it had been obtained in breach of the Interception of Communications Act and the fundamental right to the protection of privacy of communications guaranteed by the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms contained in the Jamaican Constitution. <coughs> the judge admitted the evidence. He ruled that the data could be relied upon by the prosecution even if it had been obtained in breach of the Charter or the Interception of Communications Act. Over the course of a 64-day trial, there occurred a series of incidents involving the jury. The jury was reduced to 11 members after a jury was discharged almost eight weeks into the trial. On the final day of the trial, it was brought to the judge's attention that a member of the jury who will be referred to as Jura X, had attempted to bribe other members of the jury. The judge questioned the jury forewoman, who stated that Jura X had offered bribes to each of the other jurors to acquit the appellants. The judge asked counsel for the prosecution and the defense if the trial could continue. It would not have been possible only to discharge Jura X, because under the Jury Act, a trial for murder cannot continue with fewer than 11 jurors. The judge decided to proceed with his summing up and gave a direction to the jury, reminding them of their function. The jury retired to consider its verdict at 3.42 p.m. The jury returned at 6.08 p.m. and by a majority of 10 to 1, convicted all four appellants of the deceased's murder. A fifth defendant was unanimously acquitted. Jura X was immediately arrested and was later convicted of attempting to pervert the course of justice. There was no evidence to connect his activities with the appellants. The appellants appealed against their conviction to the Court of Appeal of Jamaica, which dismissed their appeals. The Court of Appeal granted permission to appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council on three grounds, which were, first, that the trial judge failed properly to inquire into allegations of juror misconduct. Secondly, that the trial judge departed from standard practice in inviting the jury to retire to consider their verdict so late in the day, putting undue pressure on them to reach a verdict. And thirdly, that the trial judge erred in admitting the telecommunications data because it had been obtained in breach of the Interception of Communications Act and the Charter. The Judicial Committee of the Privy Council has unanimously concluded that the appeals should be allowed and the appellant's convictions should be quashed on the ground of juror misconduct, and that the case should be remitted to the Court of Appeal of Jamaica to decide whether to order a retrial of the appellants for the murder of Clive Williams. The Board has considerable sympathy with the dilemma faced by the trial judge on the final day of a long and complex trial. Following the allegations of bribery, he had either to continue with the 11 remaining jurors or to discharge the jury. Despite this, the board considers that the approach taken by the judge was a material irregularity in the course of the trial, which makes it necessary to quash the convictions. 
This is for three reasons. First, the direction to the jury on the final day was inadequate to save the situation. The judge simply reminded the jury that they had sworn or affirmed that they would return verdicts in accordance with the evidence they had heard in court. The judge did not refer to the alleged bribery, of which, if the allegations were true, the jurors were already aware. Secondly, the trial continued with the allegedly corrupt juror serving as one of its 11 members. In the board's view, there should have been no question of allowing juror X to continue to serve on the jury. Allowing juror X to remain on the jury is fatal to the safety of the convictions which followed. It was an infringement of the appellant's fundamental right to a fair hearing under the Jamaican Constitution. Thirdly, the judge should have considered whether the remaining jurors might have become, consciously or unconsciously, prejudiced for or against one or more of the appellants as a result of juror X's behavior. For example, there was a danger that the attempted bribe could have made the other jurors overcompensate, consciously or unconsciously, if they assumed that the offer must have come from one of the appellants and that therefore they must be guilty. The judge took no account of this risk. The board is very mindful of the serious consequences which may flow from having to discharge a jury shortly before the end of a long and complex criminal trial. It is also very conscious of the danger of deliberate attempts to derail criminal trials by engineering situations in which it is necessary to discharge the jury. In England and Wales, there is legislation which allows a judge in certain situations to discharge a jury because of jury tampering and to continue the trial by judge alone. There is no such legislation in Jamaica. It follows that there will be occasions where, as in this case, a court will have no alternative but to discharge a jury and end the trial in order to protect the integrity of the system of trial by jury. In view of its conclusion on the issue of juror misconduct, the board holds that it is not necessary to express a concluded view on the other two grounds of appeal. For these reasons, the appellant's appeals should be allowed. The court is now adjourned. Okay, um, there you have it. The Privy Council has quashed the appeal of the, the four convicts in this trial, Dion, and they've sent it back to the Court of Appeal for a possible retrial. Right. Yeah. We, we were talking about that before the break, and you notice that the only issue that the, the judge spoke of here was the issue of the jury sure. misconduct and how that affected the trial, mm -hmm. and he... He did point out, you know, that they understand the situation that, that the trial judge was in having to start over a trial. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is the issue of a fair trial. And I mean, we already heard Bert Samuels. I think they were anticipating this, saying that mm -hmm. if it is that, you know, the, the Court of Appeal has to determine whether there should be a retrial, he's saying they're going to move for an immediate application for bail. That, of course, is going to be up to the Court of Appeal. And we, of course, continue to follow this situation very closely. We heard the judge there make mention of something that came up during the I'm going to beg you to, to hold because we have to do a little bit of business, as you always as say, always, as and always. take a break and we come back. So, folks, the, the appeal has been upheld. The convictions have been quashed in the Vibes Cartel um, case, and it's been sent back to the Court of Appeal. We'll have much more when we come back, including reactions from his attorneys and what's happening over in Gaza. Okay, welcome back. So we we just um, heard of the judgment being delivered in the Vibes Cartel case. It, the, the appeal has been upheld, the conviction has been quashed, it's been sent back to the Court of Appeal in Jamaica for a possible retrial. Dion, quickly. Um, I think we need to make it clear to people what the situation is because I think I see some people celebrating that cartel is going to be walking free because they, they hear that the conviction has been quashed. Now, the conviction has to be quashed before you could have the question of a retrial. But the whole point is, as the, as the judge said, the Court of Appeal is now going to decide if 
cartel and his, 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 the other three are going to be tried again. Yeah. In other words, this could, if the Court of Appeal says, yes, there's going to be a retrial, this could start all over again from scratch in the Supreme Court, meaning selection of jurors, meaning presentation of the evidence, submissions, everything, mm -hmm. a whole, everything that's involved in a new trial. So it's not over oh. yet by a long shot. Mm -hmm. It is obviously a big victory for Cartel and his team because mm -hmm. now they have another shot. But we have to wait for the Court of Appeal to see what it is they're going to decide if they're going to say this needs to go to a retrial or not. If there's no retrial, then they would go free. But if there is a retrial, then the question is going to be, are they going to get, get out bail. on bail yeah. mm -hmm. or are they going to be held pending the retrial? So there are a lot of issues yet to be decided. Help, help us understand, Dion. Um, it goes back to the Privy Council, to the Court of Appeal now. What happens? Will they have hearings um, or they will just meet and then deliver a, a, a judgment? They're, 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 they're going to, to want to hear from the sides, the parties, as to whether or not there should be a retrial or not. There can be a situation in which both sides decide and, and you know, say to the court, we don't think it would be in the interest of justice for a retrial. We know that's not going to happen here because of the submissions that were made before the Privy Council. Mm -hmm. The DPP side, the, uh, Mr. Knox, who was representing the office of the DPP, was arguing strongly that if it is that the they Privy Council decided to quash the convictions that there should in fact be a retrial while the lawyer representing Cartel and the others was saying no there should not. So we know there is no meeting of the minds on this. We mm -hmm. know that already. So it is going to be up to the Court of Appeal to make mm -hmm. that decision. Right. Um, our reporter is currently at the offices of the Jamaica Bar Association, Dion um, Sandy Williams. Um, Bert Samuels was speaking. I'm not sure if she has, if Sandy has Bert Samuels now. Sandy? Oh. Right. All right, we are trying to get Bert Samuels. He was speaking earlier um, to a group of um, journalists, but we're trying to get um, Bert Samuels, Dion. He's the lead defense lawyer in the, um, the case. That's the situation there at the Jamaica Bar Association, um, folks, where Bert Samuels is... Um, speaking to um, the reporting pool, we are trying to get uh, an interview with him um, so that we can uh, hear um, his reactions to the judgment which was delivered um, just now, quashing the convictions for um, Vibes Cartel, Sean Campbell, Kahira Jones and Andre St. John. Uh, and Dion, this is, this is fascinating. I mean, I think I heard the judge, um, of course, um, you're, I'm, I'm going to defer to you, of course. The direction was inadequate. Um, what, what does it mean by that, that direction from the trial judge for At us? The, the issue of the judge's directions to the jury is really important because the judge explains the law and explains their options. And if it is that there have been any kind of difficulties that have arisen during the course of the trial, the judge will explain to the jury how they should treat those issues. Mm -hmm. So in the case here of the, the, the corrupt juror, what we heard the Privy Council saying there is that the judge did not give proper directions to the jury. The judge should have said to the jury, you should not let knowledge of this bribery affect your decision in any way. You should not. There is no evidence. Mm -hmm. I'm just giving an example. Sure. There is no evidence, for instance, linking this bribery attempt to the defendants. You should not hold it against the defendants. You should not, therefore, let it influence whether you find um, in favor of guilt or innocence. Sense. And we were just seeing some shots there from Waterford, Gaza City. That's um, cartel's base, so to speak. And there was some graffiti that you saw on the, um, the ground there just now. But that's the situation there. We have a, a reporting team also in Gaza, so to speak. And we are um, hoping to get some reactions from his fans and followers there. And he also said that the second point was that the trial continued with Jura X and that was fatal to the safety of the trial. Yeah, because the issue is 
this man is corrupt. We know he's corrupt. And as I was mentioning earlier, he's still allowed to sit with the other jurors and he's allowed to go into the jury room with them and deliberate. And we don't know what he was saying. We don't know how the, the whole thing affected their deliberations. And the, the judge made mention of one issue that came up because a lot of people watching this were then saying, hold on. So does this mean that all I ha would this mean that all I have to do is bribe one juror or even just try to bribe mm -hmm. one juror? And then the trial is derailed. Everything happens to start over from scratch we would never get anywhere in terms of the trial process right. so the, what what the lawyer during the appeal said to the Privy Council judges is that look he understands that issue but that can't be what you you that can't be the way in which you decide okay let's keep the corrupt jury juror here he was saying he was suggesting that if that is a problem and if Jamaica thinks that this is going to be a problem or could be a problem what we need to do is change our law as has been done in England and we heard the judge made mention of, make mention of it there yes, yes. so essentially what the law would then say is that if you have a situation where you need to dismiss an entire jury or you need to dismiss so many jurors that you no longer have a jury that mm -hmm. is the required number in law, mm -hmm. then you are allowed to dismiss the jury and the case then continues before the judge alone. Currently, Jamaica does not have that law in place. So in Jamaica, if it is that we have to dismiss the jury, the trial would have to start over okay. from scratch. Because okay. I think there's been a lot of focus on this particular corrupt juror. Mm -hmm. But as the judge mentioned earlier there, and I think a lot of people forgot, there was a juror that had to be dismissed earlier on. Right, right, she right. had come to the judge and she had said that her son was at the Horizon Remand Center and that the defendants at the time in the matter had come to realize that he was there because she went there to visit him. She went to the judge and she said, I'm afraid for his safety, I want off this case. Yes. And she was released. And she was released from the case. That is what, that is what brought the jury down to 11. 11. Right. So the judge was then faced with a situation where if he dismissed this corrupt juror, he then would have 10 and 10 jurors could not sit on this case by law. And you're saying in, in England, where the law has, has, has been amended, uh, when it drops to 10, um, there is provisions for it eventually to become a judge only whether, it, whether it's 10 I don't know or, what their what number, number is, is in terms of how many jurors but the problem the point is if they have to dismiss their entire jury mm -hmm. if, if it's for, for whatever reason or it drops, a ridiculous contamination number or something, or yeah. drops mm -hmm. or whatever it is they have a provision mm -hmm. that their trials can still continue mm -hmm. because especially after this particular trial there is going to be I think a very real concern that in any kind of criminal yes. trial people are going to say oh Okay, since one if I bribe somebody and then you know the trial is, is gonna be has has to be has to be has to be derailed. We should point out though, we should point out that the corrupt juror in this case was tried, mm -hmm. he was convicted in the parish court and he was sentenced to nine months in prison. So it's not at all that he got off awful. scot free here. Right. I, I, I see some more judicial reform, new legislation coming. Um, particularly following this case, Dion? I think that's one issue. I think the other issue that's, that, that arises is whether we're going to see an increased thrust for the continued abolition of jury trials. We've seen jury trials abolished in a number of different types of cases. Mm -hmm. Juries don't sit in, in commercial cases, in defamation, in a number of, of other kinds of cases. And we have heard mm -hmm. a number of people in authority, including, including the, the Chief, Chief Justice, Justice mm -hmm. say strongly that they believe that we should abolish jury trials because they're simply too problematic. I think this is one more bow in the in the arrow for people who are of that view. And 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 this um, of course has been met with some significant resistance from the, the bar and a person's at the bar. Defense lawyers oh, yes. um, are very strongly of the view that jurors should not be abolished, that the jury system serves a, a lot of, um, mm -hmm. uh, serves a significant purpose, that it's very important, especially in cases like murder, to, to have a, a panel of your peers sit and mm -hmm. just listen to the facts and come to a decision. Mm -hmm. Mark you, the bar was very much against the, uh, the, the, the law that gave the right of appeal to the prosecution, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that went ahead despite the opposition. So I don't think the opposition in and of itself mm -hmm. will necessarily stop it if the legislators have decided that this is going to make for a, a smoother justice system. And we're having all kinds of issues with jury trials in terms of getting enough jurors and so on. And the, the, 
the, the judge also made reference to the fact that the juror X sat in the deliberation and as you were suggesting early in the preamble before we got to the judgment that what would other jurors be um, be thinking um, knowing that he was there what did he say to them and stuff so they, yeah. they raised that also as a significant point yeah and i want to stress that a little bit because you know to make sure people understand the point that is being made here that say you're part of a jury right and you me and you on the jury mm -hmm. and then i hear say you milton were trying to bribe the other jurors maybe you were trying to bribe me to hand down a not guilty verdict and my thing would be, wait, what go on, yes, sir? You know, no mm. man, something not go on. You know, mm. something, I'm just going to come down and hand down and not a guilty verdict, verdict. to overcompensate Compensate. is the word that the judge, judge used indeed, yes. for the attempted bribery. In mm -hmm. other words, the, the concern is that the jurors might have felt that, all right, there is an attempt here to, to force a not guilty verdict mm -hmm. by corruption, mm -hmm. you know, by unlawful means. So let us stand in the breach yes, and yes. make sure yes. that the verdict is one of guilt. Uh, so the question is, were the correct considerations weighing on the minds of the jurors when they made that determination of a guilty verdict? We've talked about a retrial. The, 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 the original trial took 64 days. You think that the, the, if there is a trial, a retrial, a fresh trial, it will take that long? Yes, because I think that there would have to be an, a considerable attempt to, to dot every single I to cross every single T because there are a number of concerns mm -hmm. that arose in relation to this trial. We spoke about the issue of the custody of the cell phone. There was also the concern about the, 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 some of the, the, the telephone data evidence and the fact that the law wasn't followed in relation to the person, the particular police officer who applied to Digicel so? for the cell phone evidence and who received it was not authorized by law to do so. Now, those are not issues on which the Privy Council decided to, to, to comment because you heard them say that the issue of the jury misconduct was so strong, strong and so determinative that they did not feel the need to comment on any other issue. But it's something, again, we have to look at. How could such a rookie mistake have been made in such Indeed. an important, in any trial, so but certainly in such so an important right. trial? It, it Mind. And in, in a, a retrial, the issues that they had where the defense had questions about, say, the, the cell phone and stuff, would there be any issues or trouble in introducing those uh, pieces of evidence again? Well, I, I have it given that the Privy Council didn't really um, mention them in the judgment. Right. I mean, what we would see, it's always going to depend on, on how the matter unfolds in court and what a judge on a what the particular judge in the particular case decides to do. The thing with a retrial is that you then have had a situation where the first trial has served almost as a, a I don't want to use the words dress rehearsal, but everybody's hand has now been played. Right, you know, right. you, you know all the evidence that's going to come forth. You know the evidence that people are going to give so everybody on both sides can prepare that much better to tr both sides are going to be trying to come stronger to, to do it better the second time around I, before you continue i just want to again to keep stressing to our viewers that this is not a case of a decision being made either way in Me. terms of a retrial that is a decision that's going to be made by the court of appeal our local court of appeal I indeed indeed and thanks for clarifying that if though it, there's a retrial, could, for example, fresh evidence be introduced? But, well, it is a new trial. So it could be. Okay. Um, you know something, I'm gonna take a pause on that one, Milton. Let me just, let me go back and double check on that one. Okay. Because I know there are specific rules that govern whether or not you're gonna bring in fresh evidence and I don't want to mislead our viewers. So I'm gonna tell you frankly, let me double check on that okay. one. Okay, and, and finally, cause we're wrapping up now, when um, next, or, or how soon do you think the Court of Appeal will commence um, um, hearings into this matter? I wouldn't even hazard a guess. I mean, I would think that the matter is one of such significant public interest. Mm -hmm. um, I am pretty sure that his attorneys are going to be moving very quickly to, to, to make that application for bail. You know, I expect to see that as soon as possible. And then depending on whether or not bail is granted, we'll see what unfolds after that in terms of the timetable that, that's set out. And um, the appeal for bail would be to the Court of Appeal? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you, you, are, um, you want to share with us in terms of, of this um, judgment and lessons learned? Um, lessons learned? 
<laughs> Lessons learned, I would say, go to the issue of, I, I think the jury management issue is one of the major things for us. The chain of custody of evidence and the jury management is something that I think is a big thing that we're going to be talking about going forward from this. I think it's also going to reignite re ignite discussions. Those people who believe strongly that we should hold on to the Privy Council as our final court of appeal, I think this is going to energize them because the court of appeal issued a unanimous judgment in which they upheld the convictions here. The late Justice Dennis Morrison, one of our brightest legal minds, was in fact um, um, presiding over that panel, and the court of appeal unanimously upheld the conviction. Sure. So those people who have been saying we have to hang on to the Privy Council, so this is going to be more fuel Before for them. Then. All right, Dion, we, I'm, I'm told we have our reporter, Sandy Williams, who's at the Jamaica Bar Association with Bert Samuels, lead attorney for the defense. Sandy, go I'm ahead. Just the name, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anthony, what I'm going to do this. Milton, I'm currently at the office of the Jamaica Bar Association with the legal team for Mr. Sean Campbell, one of the men who were convicted and is serving time in the Vice Cartel murder case. Now, Mr. Samuels, can you give us your reaction to the ruling of the Privy Council, which was handed down shortly? Well, to consider the men have been in custody, Sean Campbell, who we represent, for over 13, 14 years, we are elated that their convictions have been quashed by the Privy Council. And now we're going to see what will go going forward, whether whose legal team will be to go to the Court of Appeal to argue that there should be no retrial. Okay, so what's the next step forward after that? The next will you step be representing him going forward? Well, it depends on his choice. Our retainer with him, our agreement is now over today. If he wants us to continue, we are more than willing to represent him. Have you spoken to your client? No, I have not spoken to him. You mean in the last 10 minutes? Right, before the, yes. No, before the, no the, the we, we, we have not been in communication for a while, but you know, I know his um, other persons have contacted him, and I'm in contact with those persons. Okay. All right, that is Mr. Bert Samuels, the attorney at law representing Sean Campbell. Along with Ms. Samuels. Along with Ms. Samuels, yes. representing Mr. Sean Campbell in the Vibes Cartel murder case. It's back to you in studio. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, elated at the quashing of the conviction, and we will argue no retrial. Yeah, um, as I said, I know they're going, to, they're going to argue the issue of the length of time that Cartel and others have been in custody. We've also heard reports about the fact that he's been in ill health. I understand mm -hmm. their yes. conditions about the, their questions and concerns about the conditions of the prison. Mm -hmm. In fact, that he's been held in as well. And I think all those issues are going to be brought to bear in the argument that there should be no retrial. On the other side, what I would be expecting to hear from the prosecution is that this was such a heinous case you know, I mean, everybody remembers the testimony about we chop up lizard, fine, fine, fine and dash him away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is going to be, I think, a very strong argument coming from the other side that in the interest of justice, that in the public interest, mm -hmm. that this matter should be tried again, unless it is, I think, that the director's office feels that they cannot successfully mount another prosecution. Is it possible that the prosecution may say, given the time that's passed and... and you know, custody of the evidence and so on, that we don't think we can um, um, mount a successful trial that they could not. Yeah, I mean, it's going to depend on, as I said, their knowledge of, of their witness, whether or not their witness is willing to testify again. So, I mean, we'll see what happens in that respect. However, I mean, we've seen situations in Jamaica where we've had up to, for instance, three retrials in particular, three trials in particular cases, you know. So just the fact that it's a retrial in and of itself isn't grounds to say, let's not go ahead. Okay. There will have to be the other supervening factors that both sides will argue and on which the, the court will make a decision. E 11 or 12 years between the trial and, and the Privy Council ruling, quite, quite a long time. It, it, I think it depends on your perspective, though. Remember, they were sentenced to life in prison. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the, the, con the, the sentence was life in prison with 20 odd years for some before the possibility of parole and 30 odd years in the case of cartel and one of the others before the possibility of parole. And I stress it that way because mm -hmm. I find people tend to assume that after the 20 years, 30 years, 15 years or whatever, the person is automatically released on parole. There is no automatic release. It has to, it's a process and the person may or may not be released. But the sentences were life in prison. So if it is that the, the court perhaps feels that there is very strong evidence and in the interest of justice there should be a retrial, then we very well could we start doing this all over again. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. But that's justice and our justice system um, and the, very, the layers. That's why we have layers in our, our judicial system um, to, to work out all the kinks and to correct mistakes made at the lower levels as well. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens now. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, thanks so much to our legal correspondent, Dion Jackson Miller, who is, has everything covered and pretty much everything she said as a possibility the judges um, worked from one of them, which was that it would go back to the Court of Appeal for a possible retrial. So we wait, await um, that um, hearing and what the Court of Appeal in Jamaica will decide. Until later, Midday News comes up in a few minutes and we'll have primetime news where we'll get more reaction and more from Dion in primetime news and Dion of course will be on radio on beyond the headlines as well thank you so much for joining us